Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open Observability Talks. I'm your host, Otan Horvitz, and here at Open Observability Talks, we talk about anything DevOps, observability, and open source. So may the open source be with you. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Logs.io, the cloud-native observability platform. Logs.io takes the best-of-breed open source projects, such as Prometheus, OpenSearch, and Jaeger, and offers them as a unified observability platform built for scale. For those joining the live stream, stream or on YouTube or Twitch, feel free to share questions or, and comments on the chat. It uh, definitely makes things more interesting for us here on the uh, Fireside Chat. And let's move on to today's episode. Last episode, I discussed here uh, the challenges of monitoring Kubernetes operationally, things such as configuration complexity, high churn rate, etc. Today, I'd like to talk about the challenge of monitoring your Kubernetes spend. With the current financial climate, cost reduction is the top of mind for everyone. IT is one of the biggest cost uh, centers, and companies realize that they simply don't understand the cost of their Kubernetes workloads, uh, or even have observability into basic units of cost. So we'll discuss this and the FinOps discipline uh, for addressing this. And there's also a fascinating open source project, OpenCost, which aims to provide an open standard around that. And for this topic, I invited Matt Ray, who is the senior community manager for the, the open source uh, open cost project. He's also a veteran in the uh, open source and the DevOps communities, and also a fellow podcaster. Uh, let me invite Matt uh, to the stream. Hey, Matt, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Glad to be here. And, and thanks for uh, taking this uh, live stream so early in your uh, time. You're based in Australia, so it's like 6 a.m. now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's early, but, you know, uh, monetary never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm based in Tel Aviv and working a lot with uh, US, especially West Coast. I, mm -hmm. I know the, the challenges, but uh, with Australia, it can be even uh, even more uh, interesting. Yep. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, you're a, a co-host of uh, your podcaster and you're a co-host of the uh, Software Defined Talk podcast. Uh, yes. A small anecdote, by the way, last week I... Uh, I delivered talks in Belgium at uh, FOSDEM and the uh, Config Management Camp. And there I ran into your uh, co-host, uh, Michael Cote. Yep. Uh, so I hope he's with us today on the live stream. I did invite him personally. <laughs> uh, so maybe before we go into today's episode, uh, do you want to tell us a bit about the show? Uh, sure, sure. So uh, Software Defined Talk is a podcast that uh, I formed with uh, two of my friends, uh, Brandon Wichard and Michael Cote. Uh, each of us has kind of a, a different background in the enterprise software industry. Uh, Cote is, uh, he's coming from, he's currently in like kind of marketing, but he's got a background as an industry analyst. Uh, he worked for Red Monk and 451 Group. Uh, he also worked at Dell and uh, mergers and acquisitions. So he's got kind of an inter interesting industry uh, background. And then uh, Brandon uh, has been product manager uh, for a, uh, quite a while, different uh, monitoring platforms. Uh, I think he worked at Boundary back in the day. Um, <clears throat> he's worked at uh, OpenID uh, or, you know, <clears throat> identity related uh, startups. And uh, we all work together at uh, BMC, you know, one of the granddaddies of, of monitoring. And uh, uh, and my background is engineering and, uh, you know, uh, community and uh of developer relations and and kind of uh, down down that path, and so the three of us have different kind of viewpoints on how the industry works. And uh, we've been podcasting for about seven or eight years now, and I think we hit episode four hundred last week. So we're wow. we're still still going strong, and we all uh, live in different sides of the planet. So it's it's a uh, it's fun to bring that in. Uh, Cote lives in Amsterdam. I live in Sydney, and uh, Brandon's back in Austin, Texas. <laughs> That's amazing. I, this this show has been around for uh, this is the third year, but looking at uh, more veteran uh, shows such as yourselves uh, is definitely a, a lot to learn there. So uh, great to see that, and hopefully uh, my followers that uh, that like podcasts will definitely find interest. I, I highly recommend that. Yep. And and let's talk about FinOps. That's a, yeah. a hot topic these days, uh, as I mentioned in the opening, and with the potential recession. Many organizations these days are looking for what the uh, what they're spending money on. 
and uh, definitely cloud and uh, infrastructure cost is typically the second highest line item after the salary cost, I think. So uh, it's definitely top of mind for everyone. So before delving into the details, maybe let's start with level setting the, the basics. Um, can you help us figure out what, uh, what, de- what FinOps is all about? Yeah. Sure. So, so FinOps is, um, well, there's a, a, the, the FinOps org, uh, which is a, a foundation uh, under the Linux Foundation. So, you know, they're uh, uh, open source, you know, without being, you know, code based. Uh, it's a group that came together to kind of talk about the intersection between cloud finance and operations. You know, uh, everybody is, not everybody, but most people are, are starting to run a lot of uh, operations in the cloud. And it's a different cost model. You know, instead of going and buying a bunch of servers and you know, waiting for them to be racked and eventually deploying your stuff three months later, uh, you buy on demand. And so from the finance side of the house, that's a really different model. Instead of, instead of just buying a bunch of stuff and sitting it in your own data center, now you're renting by the hour, by the minute, by the second. And um, having to like bring that intersection of of understanding how your costs are, are run and how they how they escalate, how they are managed, and what the development and operations need to do with your infrastructure, uh, that's kind of where FinOps lives. And so nobody is, um, it's 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 a new practice. I mean, I was you know, talking to my kids uh, the other day. You know, my my son was like, "Oh, is AI going to put everybody out of business?" And I was like, "No, you just you you keep moving forward." You know, the jobs of to, of the future, you don't know about today. And like, if you told me when I was a kid that I would be working at an open source financial operations monitoring platform, I would just look at you cross-eyed. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's a new thing, but um, they, they put on their first conference in 2019. Uh, they put out a platform uh, that, or a framework, if you will, that kind of explains what they consider how you think about these things, you know, what you need to consider, um, what uh, principles you need to adopt, you know, things like bringing obs- observability into your entire stack, bringing in all the stakeholders in, you know, it's not just, it's not just engineers, it's not just finance. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's lots of different folks in between. And, you know, how you, how you track these things, how you, uh, how business you know it makes decisions. You know, are you going to spend more because you're selling more, or are you need, do you need to cut costs because you know uh, you know there's a belt tightening phase? Uh, what do you need to do? And and FinOps gives you kind of uh, a bunch of different uh, you know maturity phases and and principles around it. It's uh, it's it's a it's a great framework. You know if if you haven't heard about this, and if uh, if you haven't started and you're in the cloud, you should start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, definitely, and then it's very easy, just find it in finops.org. So very easy to find it online and lots of useful resources. It is under the Linux Foundation, but as you said, it's not about code rather than about, uh, let's say, uh, principles yeah. and, and uh, guidelines. And what I found, uh, not, not specifically just in the FinOps Foundation, but in general in applying FinOps, we, for example, in at Logs.io, where I work, we have a designated FinOps team. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and when I try to explain to other people or to newcomers or, or others what, what it is about, I emphasize always that it's about um, maybe first and foremost about communication and about uh, culture. Uh, that's, for me, the essence about uh, maybe breaking silos, uh, obviously providing visibility and observability into the cost unit, but also creating this ongoing conversation about the mm-hmm. cloud costs, uh, loop these costs into uh, business decisions, uh, and uh, and getting people to talk together. You know, bringing business and finance side of the house to talk with engineering or with product. In under normal circumstances, these uh, organizations don't uh, communicate so smoothly together. They also think differently. You know, engineering with the agile, with the quick, with the fast, with the uh, Break fast, fail fast, and mm-hmm. and finance with a very uh, uh, orderly, <laughs> long formal processes. So, I, both both the, both sides of the house need to adjust uh, to, to make this happen. So that that's for me. Um, and maybe one more point that I found useful uh, is the uh, the core principles, uh, the, like mm-hmm. the six core principles that I think are very good for those who are just 
starting uh, the house. Uh, like I mean, the, the collaboration is obviously one of them, and uh, ownership is another very important thing. That uh, engineering can't just say, "Okay, we are about building the software; someone else to take care of uh, of the cost and the infrastructure uh, elements and things like that." Now. It's an integral part, accountability, ownership uh, built into the, uh, baked into the uh, organization. Obviously, the uh, uh, observability side of things that uh, comes with it. You can't take ownership if you don't have very clear reporting and, and uh, dashboarding and ways to see where things stand. Uh, so all of these, I think, principles are very, uh, very useful, especially for those who are not who are new to that. And uh, even before getting into Kubernetes and things like that, which, whoever uses... Uh, uh, SaaS and uses uh, cloud, uh, definitely uh, highly, highly recommend. Yeah, yeah. And, and they've got a great O'Reilly book uh, called, you know, uh, <laughs> Cloud FinOps. And um, second edition just came out uh, like a week ago, two weeks ago. So uh, if you haven't, if you haven't bought that book yet, you know, definitely check it out. It's, it's by a bunch of the different authors. Uh, or the authors, most of them work for the, the FinOps org at this point. And so, uh, you know, I, I highly recommend that just to anybody who's who's getting into the space, you know, because, um, you know, you're going to learn something new. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we mentioned several uh, stakeholders involved. I mentioned like business and finance and engineering product. I'm curious from your perspective, who are the core stakeholders that you see involved in these processes? Well, so, you know, to, to clarify, like my day job is I work for a Kubernetes cost management platform. So we are we are on the, the more technical end of the spectrum, generally. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of my coworkers have come from some of the, the larger, more established cloud um, financial platforms. You know, so you know, we, the, the space is it's not new. I mean, you know, as, as soon as as soon as Amazon started letting people, you know, do S three and EC two, you know, bills started showing up and people started having conversations with finance, <laughs> and and so uh, you know, the stakeholders over the years have you know it, it's 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 you know it's finance, it's you know CTOs, CFOs, it's engineering. Um, everyone's trying to work that that out. Uh, most of the people I talk to uh, before I, I you. Know, change roles within KubeCost to the, the open cost side of the house is uh, I was working with larger our larger customers, you know, customers spending million dollars a month on AWS, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And um, mostly I was seeing folks from the engineering side, you know, they, they had been told that they were spending too much um, and they needed to get a handle on what was going on. Or uh, they were a large enterprise where lots of different teams were consuming cloud resources and they needed to um, they needed to sort out, you know, chargeback or, or showback. And, uh, you know, for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with large enterprises, um, a lot of times you get this bill and, you know, somebody has to take responsibility internally. And, you know, you might have different budgets. And, and so uh, the, the nice version of it is showback, where you show who's responsible for, you know, hey, you know, team A uh, is 60% of the usage and team B is, is 40%. And, and chargeback is when you actually have a established budget. Um, it came from the days of, of enterprise software where you had all this, you know, compute internally and people had to share. And now that, you know, you have to share the bill uh, for an external, of course, uh, it, it's, it's chargeback. And, um, you know, but, but with, with Kubernetes, a lot of it is such a black box to... Uh, to, you know, even to engineering, engineering generally doesn't pay close attention to their bills. They're, they're not thinking, you know, oh, you know, when I'm call this function, it's going to cost you know, 30 cents more a day. No, nobody thinks that way. Um, and so initially, uh, just like the, the FinOps model talks about, you know, crawl, walk, run. Um, we like to just bring in some observability, get people looking at what they're doing. And, you know, you don't have to uh, you know, we, you don't have to have chargeback. You don't even have to, you know, it, it's showback. You're just showing people what they're using. Um, and, and in some cases, we even call it shame back. <laughs> because, you know, you're like, did you really need, you know, a, a triple XL large to run Nginx? You know, probably not. But, you know, it is costing $1.30 an hour. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's just getting people comfortable with the idea that everything you're doing costs money somewhere. And, and so, you know, we like to, to bring that 
that cost monitoring into the conversation. And, and how do you, uh, beyond the tooling, I know that you're from the tooling side of the house, but looking yeah. at it from the end user perspective or uh, the one, the driver, a, the agent within the organization trying to drive this uh, awareness, how do you create awareness amongst engineers to cost and to spend? <laughs> usually, usually someone outside of engineering has noticed the bill, right? Uh, somebody has said, you know, hey, have you noticed that, you know, last month we spent 100,000 and this month we spent 150,000. Is this going to continue every month? You know, uh, is this what's this growth look like? And so, um, you know, somebody who's responsible for that bill goes over to uh, engineering management. Usually, it's not like you know they call up the the nginx the, the DevOps team and says, "Hey, you guys, you know, can you fix this?" They they start at the management layer and say, "You know, this is this is, you know, can you justify this?" They're not saying stop it, you know, because clearly. The business is there to deliver some purpose. You know, IT is is not just running servers because they like blinking lights. Um, they're they're there to you know deliver value, and so uh, you know that that conversation gets held. Where uh, you know, can we bring in just a little bit of visibility? Can we see what's going on? You know, and and maybe maybe you could say, well, you know what, La- last month was uh, Christmas or you know Lunar New Year on our side of the planet, um, and you know there was a, a big rush of of you know, need for compute, you know, the big shopping season and, you know, next month's going to be fine. And if it's not, we'll, we'll come back and revisit this, but um, it's usually coming from the business side. They've got concerns, you know, and if you're in a small startup, everybody's on the same team at the beginning, yeah. right? You know, you see that bill, you, you become aware of it, but really as, as soon as you start to spend that money, um, somebody will probably wonder like, are we spending too much? And, you know, what we want to do is, is, start that conversation of like, look, here's how you're spending your money. And maybe it's just fine. But uh, I can tell you when I look at customers' bills, it's not fine. Um, they're, usually there's a lot of uh, waste. Um, what we call it we call it idle, right? Uh, because yeah. you've, with the cloud, um, there's, there's kind of two models of consumption. There's on to, uh, uh, usage-based. So if you're doing um, S3, you know, well, S3 is not a great example. If you're doing like Lambda, Right? You pay by by the usage. You pay every time you make a call. You pay some fraction of a cent. Yeah. And you know, if you do a million calls in one day, it's this much. And if you do five calls the next day, it's less. And that's great. But the other, the more common model is 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 uh, uh, but based on what you've allocated. You know, I say I need to run fifteen EC two instances, and they're going to run twenty four seven for three weeks. Well, I don't get to say, well, you know, they weren't really busy for part of that time. So I'm not going to pay the full price. Like Amazon doesn't care. Uh, you have those machines allocated to you, you will pay the full price. And so if you're using them a hundred percent, that's great for you. If you're using them 5%, that's great for Amazon because <laughs> they're going to, they're going to resell that capacity to someone else. But, um, you know, you're paying either way. And so what we would look for is that unused cost. Uh, we we want to optimize. We want to optimize for usage. You know, if if your usage is spiky, well, you know, sometimes you have to you have to give yourself some headroom. If your usage is flat and you're paying, you know, a lot for hardly anything, well, you can optimize that. Um, yeah. And that's just one one form of optimization. There's there's lots. Yeah, obviously. And you mentioned Amazon and in general, the cloud providers. They do provide. You no, know, first of all, you get the bill and you have some breakdown in the bill, and they have their own. Uh, uh, cost uh, uh, tools such as uh, I don't know uh, AWS Cost Explorer yeah. things yeah. such as that. So, what can you do with these, and where do they fall short in your perspective? Right, right. So, for most people, uh, the the Amazon bill there's there's two bills. Um, there's the 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 one page bill, <laughs> which. Nobody really likes that bill. I mean, you know, if if you show it to a CEO, they're like. What does you know a million dollars of EC2 mean? And there's no breakdown. Um, and then the other bill is called the cost and usage report, um, and that uh, is the very, 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 very fine grained uh, JSON report of everything that you do in EC2 that costs money. And Amazon drops it in an S3 bucket for you, uh, and you can consume it and with the tool of your choice. And you know all all the different. Uh, 
billing tools, you know, that, uh, that read your bill, they're going to look in this and this is where it has your discounts. You know, you, you might get uh, savings plans or reserved instances. Um, you might have, uh, you know, something, you know, discounted pricing that you've negotiated with Amazon. Well, you know, I, I keep saying Amazon, but, you know, Azure, GCP, uh, all the cloud providers do this. They have very, very fine, detailed, complicated bills that need to be processed. And those aren't human readable. And so that's the kind of the two ends of the spectrum for you as consumer. And then Amazon provides tools like the Cost Explorer. And it says like, look, your bill was, you know, we'll just say a million dollars. And as you drill into it, you can say, well, half of it was EC2. And then you drill into that. You can continue to, to go down and see like per instance, how much you were spending, which days, you know, what, what uh, you were paying for, you know, you've got some VPCs, some storage, you know, all those things. And you can, you can see all the details, but it's not machine readable. Uh, it's not something that you can easily integrate on your side into your, uh, f uh, you know, your visualization tool of choice. You know, whether it's you know Grafana or you know Crystal Reports or Excel, um, you're going to want to consume that and put it into you know your financial engine or your monitoring engine. You know, uh, both of them are, are are endpoints that you know people care about, um, and so that's. And they don't know anything about Kubernetes, right? And, and and you probably don't. You don't want Amazon saying, you know, hey, business team A did this and business team B did that. You're like, you know, stay out of our business. Uh, <laughs> so um, they don't know anything about what's happening inside the nodes. You know, so they're like, it, when you get your your EKS, you know, your uh, uh, Amazon Kubernetes bill, it's EC2 with a management fee. Um, yeah. You don't know anything more than that. For you know which which namespace was doing what, which you know uh, deployments were were costing you, um, that's you know completely uh, uh, opaque to you as an EC2, as an AWS customer um, from your bill aspect, and that's yeah. that's what we do. So uh, before getting into the tooling, I just uh, I yeah. want to clarify. So FinOps started around the cloud costs in general, and. Uh, you gave some good examples. Some people don't even understand when they have like reserved capacity, how how well they utilize it, or when they do on demand and how the on demand uh, performs and and the trade offs, things such as that. Lots to do there as well. Uh, but since we started touching about Kubernetes and this is the the topic of today, how is Kubernetes spend different from the cloud spend we've we've done so far? Um, so, I mean, Kubernetes has been, for most customers, just part of their bill. Um, you know, most most shops uh, are, are not 100% Kubernetes. Uh, you know, they're going to have some you know, traditional workloads that are, are running on, on cloud instances. Uh, you know, you've got some Windows machines uh, running in the cloud. Uh, that's generally not Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got some S3, some uh, databases, you know, Beanstalk, you know, wh what, whatever it might be. Um, that's not the Kubernetes side of the house. And so uh, for us, um, you know, we saw, you know, we saw that most workloads were headed this direction uh, and, and not most, but um, a significant portion of the market and, and the tooling did not really serve them. And, and the first edition of the Cloud FinOps book didn't really cover um, containers and, and Kubernetes uh, really at all. You know, because I mean, there's there's a, a brief chapter on it, but uh, it's brief, and um, you know, so we kind of saw this opportunity, uh, and that's that's where you know, uh, KubeCost and later OpenCost, the the open source component came from, is you know, we wanted to make sure that everyone could kind of get visibility into what's happening there. Um, so, what's <laughs> you know, what, what's kind of different about it is it, it's just not a box that had been opened by uh, most of the cloud tools at this point. Yeah, but but I, I do think, uh, at least when I when I uh, try to analyze the way that, uh, that I did that in this organization, previous organization that I worked in, there are some different characteristics that I, I do see, like, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the difficulty to track uh, when, when you're looking at the cloud costs and the shared resources, um, mm -hmm allocating the spend you gave some maybe uh, you alluded to that before uh, 
uh, allocate spend to uh, cost per customer, per team, per you know, different environments, things such yeah. as that, or tracking the cost uh, efficiency of your Kubernetes work cloud allocations over time across different aggregations. Can you uh, say what you've been seeing with your customers? Well, Kubernetes changes the game. Um, for a lot of shops, moving to the cloud was was lift and shift, right? They they're like, hey, now we don't have to have a data center, and they just move their workloads. their you know fairly static, not very dynamic workloads uh, into the cloud. You know, they they clean things up, and you know, for some of them, uh, they didn't get the savings they really expected in the cloud because they didn't really change their operations. They're just now in somebody else's data center. But if you've made the transition to more of a cloud native model, um, which is, you know, that's essentially what Kubernetes is, where um, resources are allocated on demand. You know, you've got, uh, you've got some, you know, uh, applications that are going to run for maybe a certain amount of time, or um, they're going to run wherever it's cheapest. Uh, and they, you know, they don't have a lot of, uh, uh, that they, they are potentially ephemeral. You know, they don't have a lot of state. They can be you know, killed and rerun and moved around. When you start to get into that use case, um, billing becomes more complicated, but also uh, you can save a lot more money. Um, Kubernetes allows you to, you know, potentially condense the amount of compute you're using. So now instead of having, you know, one application per instance, you can say, well, I've got a cluster running there and let's deploy, you know, a hundred applications to it. And the cluster can be resized at, at you know, up or down. And those instances will re you know, will remove, will move to different uh, compute nodes as necessary to, to run. Um, and, you know, just like, just like virtualization saved, you know, potentially saved a lot of money by reducing the, the bare metal count or, you know, condensing it into, you know, more powerful servers that cost less because you had fewer of them. Um, Kubernetes allows us that option too. And from, you know, from the billing side side of things, that can be a nightmare because you've got machine, you've got your application today, it's running on node one and, you know, Kubernetes decided that it wanted to move it over to node two, to node three, to node four. Uh, it killed some instances, redeployed it. You deployed a hot patch. You got put on node seven. You know, that that application is just running all over the cloud, <laughs> all over what you're paying for. But when you get that bill, it just says, you know, 15 compute nodes. And you have no idea, like, well, you know, what, what did team A do? What did team B do? What was, how much of that, you know, 15 you know, how much of that 15 machines was, was any of the particular team. And so um, that changing characteristics, it makes things a little more exciting. Uh, but, you know, potentially there's savings because you can look at it and say, well, we're paying for 15 nodes. Uh, but looking at the compute, the, the, you know, the, uh, the idle across the cluster, well, we never passed the, you know, 20% usage maybe we don't need 15 nodes in our cluster maybe we can get by with you know 10 um and that's an opportunity for savings or we look at that and say hey um our kubernetes cluster has been up for three months uh we've been running 15 nodes we could reduce the size of it or we could call up amazon and negotiate uh reserved instances you know hey we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and pay for 10 nodes a month at a 50 percent discount for the next year and you know that you can get deals like that uh, because Amazon likes to know that you've paid up front and you like to save money. And so, and your workloads, you know, they might be really dynamic, but the base infrastructure they're running on is statically priced. And so that's, that's comforting uh, on the financial side of things. You know, when things become more predictable, even if on top of it, on top of your Kubernetes, it's, you know, you're deploying, you know, 30 times a day, that's fine. As long as you know the EC2 nodes just stay there and, and get charged the same amount. <laughs> yeah, that, that's from the from the infrastructure. But still, when trying to create this uh, this accountability that we talked about before, and you need to uh, to attribute this attribution model per team or per customer or per environment, then uh, the fact that the deployments and namespaces and so on are not really isolated uh, and they actually share the underlying resources. You, you mentioned nodes. We can also mention the persistent volumes, the load balancers, and so on then the ability to make this attribution and then make the uh, the forecasting and the capacity planning and also negotiating 
based on where you expect the uh, the business to grow in the different teams and the different product lines and so on becomes maybe a bit more uh, more challenging. Let, let's put for it sure, that way. For sure, uh, especially uh, in bigger enterprises. Remember that, that yeah. some of this is is justified from business perspective. Like uh, if it's uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, an inco- a spike in incoming requests for Rihanna's uh, Super Bowl halftime performance this week, uh, and, and you're in the business of, of uh, the media, then it, it's expected the spike is tightly mm-hmm. related to what you deliver to your uh, customers, the value, and, and hopefully you know how to monetize, or, or uh, this is the top line KPIs. It's fine. So it's yeah. different when the cost spikes because of a, a legitimate uh, business need that arises. Uh, right. Unlike cost spikes that are uh, just bad utilization or someone just left the EC2 testing or machine learning uh, model running uh, or something. Even like. malicious instances, right? When when you see a cost spike in a namespace and you're like, why is, you know, what what's going on over there? You know, and we, we've, definitely helped, we've definitely helped customers find, you know, unsecured instances or applications that have been, you know, they start mining Bitcoin and you're like, why did this cost you a hundred dollars over the weekend when it was, you know, a, a dev instance that wasn't supposed to be doing anything? And that happens too. It, it, it's weird to think of, 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 you know, the finance as a uh, intrusion detection. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it proved more than once. That's definitely one of the common stories that people discovered Bitcoin mining after uh, employing simple fi- FinOps monitoring. Uh, so, so let's talk. I think we talked about all these vendors, and one of the challenges is also that they speak uh, a slightly different language. It's not mm-hmm. there is a way that you can also compare your AWS to Azure to GCP or to other bills because there is no sort of common way of communicating. Which for me was was the way for me to explain to others about the the maybe the most basic value proposition of open cost. So uh, let's move on to open cost. Uh, this is the new uh, open source project, the new kid on the block in the, in the FinOps, uh, in the cloud native space for sure. Uh, that recently, by the way, been accepted to the CNCF sandbox. So uh, a big congratulations to you and the team there. Yeah. Um, so can you uh, tell us a bit about what uh, open cost is about? Sure. So so KubeCost, um, you know, KubeCost started, uh, I guess, about four years ago now. And, um, you know, the, the two founders uh, you know, had come, come from Google. Uh, they did some other work before starting um, KubeCost, but um, they were already you know, well, well familiar with the open source space and um, started KubeCost as uh, the KubeCost cost model as, as an open source project uh, and then added you know, additional value on top of it. Um, and, and but they, you know, the intention was like, let's get this out there as the standard for uh, Kubernetes cost monitoring. Um, you know, let, let's, uh, you know, they, they started it and, you know, COVID happened, uh, kind of disrupted a lot of plans. But uh, in June of last year, uh, 2022, uh, we announced that uh, the CNCF had uh, elevated the, uh, the, Kubernet- the KubeCost cost model to a sandbox project and they renamed it OpenCost. You know, one of the one of the uh, things you're not allowed to do in CNCF land is have the company with the same name as the uh, the project. Um, you know, you gotta give up your your trademarks and stuff, uh, which is good. Um, and so, in addition to the code base, they've been working with other um, you know other vendors, other individuals, other uh, you know, end users on writing a specification for what it means to monitor Kubernetes uh, for costs. You know, how you identify. Um, you know, different types of usage, you know, whether it's uh, idle or allocated. Um, and so there's uh, both a, a specification, uh, you know, the, the open cost uh, specification V1 uh, that, you know, talks about um, allocation monitoring. And that's that's the first pass of open cost is, is what it does is it goes and looks at the cloud uh, API. You know, so it, it says the AWS, uh, um, you have four EC2 instances running and uh, how much do they cost per hour? And the, the, open, the API just says, you know, list price is this. And it takes that and then it compares that to your Kubernetes usage. It says, well, we've got, you know, five namespaces and we've got, you know, this many instances. Um, you know, th- these are our workloads or pods or containers and it lets you slice and dice that. So you break down those uh, EC2 instances by all, all of those, you know, Kubernetes primitives, and that's uh, essentially what you get with 
OpenCost today. Uh, there's a UI uh, that lets you explore this. Uh, the data is um, uh, it's stored in Prometheus. So you know if you have a Prometheus compatible tool, uh, we could you know put it in a different backend if you want. Um, the folks over at Grafana are storing it in Mimir. Uh, you know people use Thanos, Cortex, Victoria Metrics. You know you name it. Uh, there, uh, somebody's put it in a, a different Prometheus compatible backend. Um, but OpenCost is you know it's uh, it's a CNCF project, so it's Apache license. The the goal for us with OpenCost is just make it the you know ubiquitous default monitoring stack for you know cost so as soon as you spin up uh, a cluster and uh, a kubernetes cluster in any public cloud you just throw an open cost on it to keep an eye on it and you know then put it on the dashboard of your choice uh, and so that's that's what we're doing with open cost and who is the uh, today essentially the it supports both uh, on-prem environments and also uh, yeah a cloud uh, man, uh, managed Kubernetes. Can you mention who, who is currently? Uh, yeah, Kubernetes? yeah. So uh, because this was the the engine of of Kubecost, uh, you know, they um, it already came it, it came you know working out of the box with AWS, uh, GCP, and Azure. Uh, there is support for on prem pricing, so you can upload uh, or provide uh, through a config map a um, a, a default pricing. So you can say, hey, in my data center, we charge a dollar for, uh, you know, we charge a dollar per hour per core and we charge $2 per hour for RAM. <laughs> you know, some nice simple <laughs> pricing. And that's what I do in, in my home instances is like, I, I don't have fractional sense. I just want to see nice round numbers, you know, yeah. uh, for my home usage. Um, but it lets you, you know, set that pricing. Uh, there, there's support for uh, you know more fine grain pricing. You can charge on GPUs, um, you know, because uh, you, you may be you know consuming uh, GPUs for you know AI or, or whatever. Um, and so that that's in there too. So uh, that's what it shipped with uh, back in in June. And then the open source community uh, has has started adding other other sorts of uh, platforms. So we've got uh, some patches in for Scaleway. Uh, you know, a European provider. We've got uh, some Al Aliun, you know, Alibaba's uh, public cloud. Uh, that's in there. Um, there. You know, there've been conversations with uh, some uh, other providers. Uh, we've got a, a document for how to to you know, get started. We've got a very friendly um, uh, Slack uh, channel uh, over in uh, uh, the CNCF Slack. Uh, yeah. So you know, come ask questions. I'm happy to help you add your public cloud. Um, and it's 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 not that hard uh, because we're not we're not digesting the bill, uh, you know. So I, I mentioned the the cost and usage report as this you know multi multi gigabyte JSON file. Every vendor does it differently. Those files come out; they don't come out in real time. So that's one of the one of the weird things about cloud billing is you know you have your on demand cost. You're like you look at it when you kick off your EC2 instance and it says you know fifteen cents an hour, and you're like okay, and then Maybe 48 hours later, Amazon says, well, you know, you did have some discount savings. You had a couple of credits. You had a reserved instances. It was actually only, you know, seven cents an hour. And, you know, that might change how you look at things. Um, and so open cost, that, that is a lot of complexity. You know, going and doing that reconciliation, parsing that bill on demand, you know, finding the data in there. Open cost doesn't do that yet. And, um, you know, that, that's a... I can tell you from the Kube cost engineering side of the house, that's a lot of work. Uh, most people don't, don't, you know, from the open cost side of the things, most people don't seem to miss that. You know, we're we're really just looking at like, how much is this generally costing me? And you know, the actual numbers are less important than the the direction. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, to make sure that uh, our, our listeners understand. So essentially, it's not the actual bill that factors in all the credits and the, the right, discounting right. thing. It's it's sort of a, a st relatively static mapping it's of the, the on pricing, pricing, whether yeah. from the managed cloud provider or if you map it yourself for your own prem. Yeah, it yeah. So the math on top of that, right? Right, right. It it doesn't it does not parse uh you know the 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 final bill. It's going with the list price, and you know the list price for people like me, it, I pay list price. You know, I just run some instances on my own, and you know, I, I don't I don't have an Amazon salesperson. Uh, for you know, so a lot of small medium businesses are not in any sort of negotiation. Um, but even on on places like Google with their uh, 
uh, continued usage discounts. You know, that that would show up later. But that shows up like days or even weeks after uh, you've spent the money. Um, so, you know, they're they're kind of you know, retrofitting your bill afterwards. Um, OpenCost doesn't do that. Uh, OpenCost is you, really you looking at... By the way? <sighs> um, it's a large engineering effort that uh, at this point we're, we're still... We're we're still looking at other cost sources. So, um, you know, right now, open cost provides what your what's uh, allocated for your Kubernetes. So the instances, uh, the um, storage, uh, and networking. You know, we're we're giving you that cost, uh, just you know, based off of your de- deployed Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, right now, we're actually headed towards the direction of. Uh, out of out of cluster costs, so you've got uh, a remote database. Uh, you know, a database is a service that you're uh, integrating with. You know, Kubernetes doesn't actually know anything about that. Um, but if you you know want to incorporate that bill, if you want to see that with open cost, that's what we're headed towards is is bringing in um, external uh, asset costs. So object storage, you know, S3, RDS. Monitoring, you know, you want to see how much Datadog costs you, how much uh, Logs.io costs you. Um, bring it back to your uh, your workloads. Well, that's that's where we're headed, um, which is actually different from what Kubecross does. Uh, so we're kind of diverging um, because open source uh, is usually about people scratching their itches, and the itch that most of our users have is I have other costs that I want to bring in. Um, people aren't. I mean, people are definitely concerned about, um, you know, their final bills and, you know, to, to send some business to KubeCost, KubeCost is free. <laughs> it's just not <laughs> source. Um, you know, so KubeCost is free for, for single, for single clusters and, uh, gives you 14 days of storage. So you can, you can deploy all the KubeCost you want and, you know, it's, uh, it's free until you want to do like federated views and, um, you know, more storage and, and, and stuff like that. But, uh, Maybe someday they will open source their uh, bill processing engine, but <clears throat> that is a, a enterprise beast of its own. Um, and you know what's what's I you know, on a different podcast. Uh, I heard an interview with the uh, the product manager for Amazon's billing engine, and he said that he he's pretty confident that the Amazon billing engine is the largest non government billing uh, non government software project in the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, to think about that. You think about how much compute is, you know, how how big AWS is, and everyone is running their workloads on AWS, and they're generating, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of metrics per second, or no, 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 per customer, and they've got millions of customers, and all that data has to be stored, processed, and you know, sent to billing you know, in a timely manner. And so, you know, they are a substantial piece of AWS's infrastructure is running their own internal billing engine for everybody who's on there. And, and so, uh, you know, bill, bills are, are very, very, very complicated. <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you, you know, my, my company is uh, on, the, on the larger end of the medium size, let's say. And uh, from what I see, the, the small enterprises uh, definitely uh the, the the all these packaging and all these uh crediting math uh, uh, can definitely make uh, uh move the needle and change entirely the uh the bottom line mm-hmm. uh and you have your dedicated uh, person whether you're an isv or or a medium size or enterprise but so i'm just wondering but you're saying that the pain is is less uh, from the community at least the demand comes more on the pass side of things like uh, platform pieces that they incorporate whether uh, for for data or, or others are there any other items on the uh, roadmap for uh, open cost project uh, i mean definitely uh you know one of our goals with open cost is to move out of the cncf sandbox so um you know it's it's been open source for i guess about six months now uh, and you know we're, we're trying to build up our community get external contributors more more people active uh Besides, you know, KubeCost employees. Um, last week, uh, we announced uh, Grafana Labs is is now a, a uh, contributor. 
uh, you know, they are deploying it on thousands of clusters. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if that was their number, but uh, I've heard the number of, you know, thousands of Kubernetes clusters thrown around, some of them very dynamic. Uh, and so they just deploy open cost onto everything uh, just as, you know, a, a monitoring agent to, to get visibility into the, you know, all the costs and, and they're pumping it into Mimir, uh, which is, you know, their storage backend. Um, and the, you know their use cases. Uh, you know they want they want everything on dashboards, of course. And um, you know so they've shown up, started contributing, uh, making open cost uh, more efficient. Um, and you know, part of the roadmap is you know what sort of stuff is appealing to uh, those sorts of shops. They've got they brought some things. Uh, we've had uh, you know folks from um, other cloud vendors showing up. They they want to have you know better support for their clouds. Uh, you know that's always on the roadmap. Um, we, you know, open cost is, is slowly, um, diverging from kube cost. You know, they're, they're, they're different, you know, use cases. Um, and so, uh, part of the roadmap will be things like, um, you know, taking, uh, you know, t taking these open source contributions, getting our, our own release cadence. Um, and as we, as we have more external contributors, more, you know, different documentation. Uh, we can move up up the the uh, CNCF ladder. At, you know, graduate out of being a sandbox to an incubating project, um, and and part of that is just having more external folks uh, involved. And uh, you know, it's it's still early days, but we're having you know a, a good, healthy share of of contributions from outside. Um, Open telemetry is is something that uh, has has popped up. Uh, there's some open issues uh, features for that. Uh, people would like to see uh, open cost implement that, um, and that's the sort of thing that you know open cost can do faster than kube cost because we're a much more you know we're a much smaller, more efficient project. Uh, we just you know we need more community folks uh, to get involved. That's amazing, and then glad to hear that uh, you have some more people outside of KubeCos. So it's uh, KubeCos people, but now also Grafana Lab people. Any other major uh, figures that are involved in terms of uh, entities that uh, got uh, into the project? Into the yeah, yeah. So when we when we launched uh, OpenCost, um, you know, I mentioned it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just KubeCost. Um, you know, open sourcing something. Um, we we had a uh, uh, the specification. Uh, we had folks from Adobe, uh, Armory, uh, AWS, DTIQ, Google, uh, you know, New Relic, SUSE, Pixie, um, Red Hat. You know, so uh, those folks were all involved with the specification. And so, um, you know, open cost is both a specification and a project. And so some of those shops will be uh, taking the specification and releasing their own implementations. And so, you know, part, part of that is... Um, Eventually, we'll need to form like an acceptance criteria framework, you know, that you know, looks at your implementation, ensures that you are implementing uh, the API. Um, you know, so it, it's got all of those, you know, scaffolding needs to happen. <laughs> um, you know, some of it, some of it's in place, some of it's in progress, and you know, different. Uh, and now, and today, like as we're working on the external allocation costs, you know, their different contributors are, are getting involved, uh, which is is great to see. And it's already uh, you mentioned that there's a young project, but still beyond cube cost, it is implemented in others. I think in EKS Absolutely. and others, right? So let's yeah, yeah, yeah. We we um, you know there there are folks you know showing up uh, you know multiple you know lots of questions uh, in in the Slack channel. Uh, you know, Grafana is one of the largest, you know, public deployments, um, you know, just it, it fit their use, their model very well. Uh, but um, I'm hoping to get more names uh, to publish. We've got a couple of partners uh, who have you know, um, added open cost APIs to their products. So uh, I think uh, Vantage is one of them. Um, I'm just drawing blanks uh, right now, but uh you know, look to see more open cost compatible uh, API endpoints out there, you know, especially in, in a lot of these Kubernetes total platforms where they're like, hey, you know, we, you know, we provide a dashboard to give you everything. Well, they, you know, they'll put the open cost APIs on there so you can pull your uh, financial data out uh, of them, um, whether it's, you know, actually provided by open cost, uh, the project, who knows? But you know that's the great thing about uh, being a specification is you're driving a standard. 
Exactly. And I, I think you mentioned open telemetry. It's a great uh, uh, role model to follow. And uh, if, if we can also converge and, and, uh, and do something uh, between the projects, it's definitely going to be a force multiplier. Uh, before we wrap up the, uh, the main part of this, the show, uh, uh, can you share, you, you mentioned briefly before some of them, but how can people join the community conversation, learn more and, and get involved? Right. So, uh, you know, the, the primary, the CNCF runs a, a Slack. Uh, so if, uh, if you're a member of the CNCF Slack, join us over on the OpenCost channel. Um, OpenCost.io is the website. Uh, GitHub.com uh, slash OpenCost is where uh, the, the project the website, the Helm chart, uh, those are currently there. Um, we have a uh, calendar uh, where every every uh, two weeks, every fortnight, we have a um, working group, which we kind of gather to talk about, um, you know, we have an agenda, like you know, what we're working on, um, what, you know, we're li- we need help with, you know, what people would like to see. Um, some people show up and they just, you know, want to talk about their issue. And some people uh, say, you know, hey, let's let's start this uh, uh, external asset uh, working group. So we're going to have a, a, a group kicking off um, <clears throat> a new specification uh, and a an example project. Uh, those are uh, those are about to kick off. So if, if you'd like to see external asset costs get added uh, to, to open cost, um, you know, join up. I think I think we're going to implement S3 as the example. Um, but once we're done, we'll have a specification and documentation and, you know, and a working example. Uh, so you can add whatever it might be that you'd like tracked, uh, in, in your cost monitoring and, you know, and, and then tie it back to your Kubernetes usage. That's, that's what we're doing over in open cost. Amazing. And then just a note for the listeners, if you're not, even if you're not a member, an official member of CNC, if you don't need to pay anything, the uh, Slack channel for CNCF is open for everyone. You can just uh, open your uh, user there. And once there, you have all the channels in the world for all the projects, one of which is uh, open cost, just, you know, hash open cost, and, and you'll be there in the conversation. But don't don't think that you need to be some sort of formal <laughs> member or, or, or something no, like no. open for everyone. And, and, and you should also join the, the FinOps organization. So uh, uh, FinOps org, um, they have their own Slack. Uh, there's not an open cost channel. But there is, uh, there are, there's a lot of uh, channels for different clouds, uh, different tool sets. Uh, there are working groups for things like open billing. Uh, there's a uh, Kubernetes and, and containers working group uh, that you know obviously we're active in. Um, and and so uh, OpenCost is is the only uh, FinOps uh, certified project and. CNCF project. So we're the, we are the intersection uh, of those two worlds. And so, you know, definitely join either or both uh, Slacks and uh, I'll see you there. Yeah. Sibling, sibling uh, organizations under the Linux Foundation. Yes. Great. Great. That, that was uh, fascinating. And uh, with that, I'd like to wrap up uh, this part and uh, with the few minutes that we have left to uh, cover some interesting bits and uh, uh, some breaking news and very happy for you to uh, stay stick around with me for uh, for these parts uh, you'll probably have sure. some interesting insights uh, especially with your perspective and and uh, familiarity uh, the first one i wanted to share actually is uh, uh, something that i uh, uh, have been working on recently it's uh, i call it the metrics essentials trilogy uh, it's uh, uh, three uh, articles that are meant to cover some a lot of the common uh, topics that I keep on uh, uh, encountering with uh, users, with community members, with uh, customers and, and others. So it's uh, I called it the, the phantom metrics, the expensive metrics and the unreadable metrics. Uh, phantom metrics is why your monitoring dashboard may be lying to you, a bit about the basics of how it works and what to expect of it and where the monitoring will not show you exactly where, where in real time uh, happens and uh, to take it with, uh, with the relevant uh, perspective. Uh, the expensive metrics is maybe somewhat tied to what we talked about today about why your monitoring data and bill may get out of hand uh, and associated costs with it, um, uh, like cardinality problem and other that. And, and, uh, and the last one is about uh, maybe some gu- uh, guide to effective dashboard design uh, for DevOps uh, type monitoring, uh, so you're more than welcome to uh, to check it out. It's on uh, on Medium, and very happy to. Uh, some of that, by the way, ties back to 
topics that we've covered on this show, uh, like with Ben Ziegelman about uh, uh, cost of monitoring and, and others. So uh, definitely, we, you, if you follow this show, you, it will resonate. But I think it's a good summary. And do uh, share some feedback. Uh, glad to make it a starting point for a broader discussion. Uh, uh, the next one is a, a CNCF blog about uh, what's new in Prometheus ecosystem. Uh, things such as uh, the agent mode, native histograms, uh, uh, newly added service discovery mechanisms, the Prom Lens project has been uh, contributed to uh, uh, to Prometheus and, and much more. Uh, so it offers a good rundown list, uh, and I highly recommend uh, you check it out. It also I highly recommend checking out the episode uh, we had here on the show uh, recently with Julian Pivotto, uh, which gives much more in depth, but. Uh, uh, this this blog uh, on the CNCF blog is is uh, definitely worthwhile checking out. Um, another thing we mentioned here uh, before about open telemetry. So I, I saw on the CNCF blog a very interesting uh, post uh, about migrating from open tracing to open telemetry. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar, open tracing is a, a deprecated uh, standard API specification that existed before and was then merged into open telemetry together with open census and, and some other pieces. So uh, many uh, older implementations that used to run on open tracing now uh, needed to migrate to open telemetry. This was a very good walkthrough on what you need to, uh, uh, in order to do that in a pragmatic uh, pragmatic way. Um, Matt, have you had a chance to do some sort of a migration such as that or uh, play around with that? Not yet, not yet, but I, I already had that tab open. So I, I'm definitely I'm definitely going to read that article. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. And uh, you, it used to have a shim that made it very easy, but then again, uh, uh, shielded from the real migration work that needs to be done. So I, I definitely advise not to take the shim path. I think it, the, even the shim is already sunsetted and, and not supported anymore. Uh, it's important to understand it's been uh, it diverged it, it expanded far beyond open tracing I mean open telemetry project API specifications so definitely worthwhile doing a deep migration path uh, rather than the shallow one so it's a good uh, good coverage on that um, and also some some CNCF project updates in addition to uh, the good news around uh, around uh, open course project we had some good uh, news end of year about uh, some projects like I think the most prominent ones were Argo and Flux that have graduated uh, from the CNCF incubation. So they're now in the graduated state um, and, and some others. Uh, next month uh, on the episode here, I will have uh, uh, Chris, CRA, as most of them know them, the CTO of uh, the CNCF will be here with me on the show and we'll definitely be talking about uh, the changes, the, the, the project landscape, and uh, some of his predictions. So do uh, join us uh, on next month's episode. Uh, I promise it'd be interesting. He's an interesting guy. Yep. Um, and uh, Matt, anything else that you uh, found interesting this week or uh, in the past uh, month? Um, well, uh, I, I just wanted to point out uh, OpenCost. Uh, we're going to be at the Southern California Linux Expo next month. So if, uh, if you are in the California, Southern California uh, area, definitely sh uh, show up at the conference. It's uh, North America's largest open source uh, community conference. Um, scale and so 20X, we'll, right? Yes, Scale 20X. Uh, I'll, I'll be giving a talk and uh, we'll be, uh, the open cost will be uh, sharing a booth with KubeCost. And so hopefully uh, I'll have some stickers there if, if you show up. And of course, uh, I look forward to, to seeing everyone at uh, KubeCon EU, if, if uh, you can make that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be there. So uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to meeting you finally in person, it's Matt. A, and, uh, yeah, it's all, a long haul from Sydney, but I'll be there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll so, have so a So do check also. it out. And by the way, there are lots of co-located uh, events on the first day. It's been uh, reshuffled on the... Uh, the CNCF did some bit of uh, organization there because the bit, it got a bit uh, out of hand with all the colos. So... Uh, now uh, it's consolidated. Uh, for example, all the Prom De Pro Prometheus Day and the Hotel Day and others now are consolidated to one uh, open observability day. Uh, not, not to do with open observability talks here at the show, but definitely touching upon the same, uh, the same topic. So uh, it makes it easier, just one day of all the colos uh, together. Uh, so uh, highly recommended also to check out the relevant colos uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you, Matt, and, and yep. all the others uh, they're highly recommended. Sounds great. 
So uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, how can people reach out to you uh, after the the show? Uh, yeah. So if if uh, if if you're not in Slack, uh, if you want to get a hold of me via email, um, I'm Matt Ray at uh, Kubecost.com. Um, you know, I'm on uh, uh, LinkedIn and uh, uh, Mastodon. Uh, I kind of stopped using Twitter, but I'm, I'm Matt Ray and uh, and uh, those places. So I'm usually pretty easy to find. Matt Ray on GitHub. Um, so uh, I look forward to catching up with folks. Amazing. So uh, thank you very much, Matt, for uh, joining me uh, on this early time there, Australia time. It was a fascinating talk. Um, and thank you, of course, all the listeners who joined us uh, today on this episode. Uh, all the episodes, uh, as always, uh, are uh, made available on all the favorite podcast apps or on YouTube. So uh, do check them out. And if you are listening to this show, to this show, to this episode on uh, on uh, on demand, then do know that we stream the episodes live on Twitch and uh, YouTube. So just find all the details on openobservability.io or follow us on Twitter at openobserve for updates on the next live streams and to share your comments, suggestions, news bits, uh, or anything else. Uh, and if you have something specific that you want to talk about on the show that you think that you're a subject matter expert on these relevant topics, do uh, feel free to submit a talk proposal on openobservability.io. I'm Dutan Horvitz. Thank you very much for listening and see you on next month's episode.